And let's read verses 11 and 12, and then I'll come back and introduce our topic. Paul says, verse 11, But thou, O man of God, there's our theme, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith and lay hold or take hold of eternal life whereunto thou art called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Now Paul earlier in this same chapter had warned Timothy about those false teachers who had as their theme that godliness was a way to get rich. And we spent quite a bit of time on that last week. We actually covered the first 10 verses. And Paul was warning them that they were teaching a materialistic kind of a philosophy that, you know, if you're really godly, if you're really spiritual, that's the way you're, you can become rich. And now Paul is actually going to warn Timothy to flee those things, those false teachers and that false doctrine and that materialistic center of life, to actually flee that. And in doing that, Paul is going to give us the marks of a godly man. We're actually going to have four marks of the man of God, and they also apply to a woman of God. In the context, he's speaking to Pastor Timothy, but they do apply to not only any Christian, whether a man or a woman. Now, I want to outline our study tonight. In verses 1, or 11 and 12, we have first the uh, uh, admonishments or the admonitions. And they do come in the form of actually imperatives or commands. And there's going to be four of them. Then we're going to see in verses 13 to 16, the final charge that Paul gave to Timothy. And then verse 17 to verse 19, the admonition to those that are rich, the believers that had riches in this world. And then the closing, verse 20 and 21, is Paul's urgent plea, his last closing command to Timothy. But first of all, Timothy admonishes in him, but thou, O man of God, I want you to notice that in verse 11. The phrase, but thou, is intended to get Timothy's attention. There's a contrast intended there. The word but is a word of contrast. So, so you have the false teachers, you have their false doctrine, you have the materialistic kind of philosophy of, of ministry, but he says you are to avoid that, you're to flee from that. So he's trying to get Timothy's attention. So he says, but thou, O man of God. Now he uses the title for Timothy, man of God. And we should take note of that. It's interesting because it's a more common term to be used in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, it was used of most often the prophets of God. This is not an exhaustive list by any means, but Moses was called a man of God. Samuel, the prophet, was called a man of God. Elijah and Elisha were called a man of God. And David, the psalmist of Israel, was called man of God. Now what does it mean, a man of God? Well, a man of God is a man who knows God, who loves God, walks with God, but a man who has the center of his life is God. Joseph was a man of God. Every time Joseph spoke in the pages of Scripture, he makes a reference to God. So a man or a woman of God is a man who was called by God, a man who knows God personally, a man who loves God's precepts and word and seeks to obey them and glorify them. But basically, I think the most concise statement is that a man of God has God at the center of his life, or a woman of God has God at the center of their life. They love God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their strength, and they manifest God in the way that they live. So he is a man of God in contrast to the false teachers, which one of my commentaries today I thought was interesting said were men of gold. So you have the false teachers were men of gold. This was a man of God, kind of a play on word. They were all about money. Timothy, you're to be all about God. A true minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about God. You don't do it for wages. You don't do it for money. Peter wrote to the pastors, and he said, you're not to become pastors for filthy lucre's sake. You're not, you're not to do it for hire. You to know that it's a call of God, whether you get paid or not. 
Now, what are the marks of a man or a woman of God? Write them down. The first is what he runs from. He flees those things. Notice it says, flee these things. Now, the question is, what things are you fleeing? And the answer in the context is the false doctrine and the false preaching and the false teaching of those who say that godliness is a way to get rich. So you flee those things. But as a general principle, and this is the negative, a man or a woman of God must run from sin. Amen? We must hate what God hates. If we're going to be people of God or men and women of God, then we have to flee the things that are ungodly, the things that are wicked or evil or sinful or unrighteous. Now the phrase flee there in the Greek literally means keep on fleeing. It's in the present tense, and it means continually, ongoingly, habitually, purposely, and intentionally be running away from sinful things. And it speaks of a daily obedience of avoiding sin and evil. The Bible tells us to flee fornication in 1 Corinthians 6.18. Good advice. That word fornication is the Greek word pornea. It's the general term for sexual immorality. And if there's anything that you ought to run from as a man or a woman of God, it's you ought to run and run with all your might from sexual immorality. That, that wars against your soul. It will ruin your relationship to God. So whether you're married or single, doesn't matter. Child of God is to abstain from sexual immorality. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 14, that we're to run or to flee from idolatry. So we run from fornication and we run from idolatry. And idolatry is anything that might take the place of God in our life. So we're to avoid anything that would captivate our love for God. And then thirdly, we are to flee youthful lust. And we're going to see this in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22. Flee youthful lust. Paul says. But here in the context, he's telling us to flee false teachers, to avoid them. In Romans 13, verse 14, Paul says, Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So we're to not to, to make provision for the flesh, put Jesus on. I think also of, of a living example, I mentioned it Sunday, of Joseph. Remember when Joseph was hired by Potiphar in Egypt? And Potiphar evidently was neglecting his wife or busy, or he was just a busy, busy businessman. But Joseph was his steward and over his things, and so he was there. And Mrs. Potiphar thought Joseph was very good looking and very handsome. And she, you know, got eyes for Joseph, and she started making passes at Joseph. And wanted to get involved with Joseph. And finally, she just grabbed a hold of Joseph and said, Joseph, lie with me. And what does the Bible say Joseph did? He what? He ran. I talked about the smart thing to do is just to get out of there. He didn't say, do you think we can talk about this for a little bit? I'm not sure this would be the right thing to do. Let's go have coffee or let's go have lunch or let's discuss the matter. You know, He said, no, just bye. And he took off. Now, someone might say, well, you know, that might hurt her feelings or hurt her feelings. That might be offensive or that might make her not feel good. Make her not feel good. Sometimes people will get drawn into flirtatious kind of relationships and temptation relationships because they're just trying to be sociable and they're trying to be nice and, you know, it's the thing to do. You need to be careful. If you're a married person, you need to be really careful and keep your distance people that are the opposite sex. I mean, you know, treat them with respect and be nice, but you don't socialize with them. You don't hang out alone with them. You don't go to lunch with them. You don't go to dinner with them. You don't ride in the car with them. You, you need to be careful. So Joseph is a great example. The opposite is the bad example of David, which is interesting. I just said he's a man of God, but he fell into adultery. He was on the rooftop and he saw Bathsheba in the next courtyard. And when David should have gotten off of the roof, he should have gotten down off of the roof and taken a cold shower probably. 
Instead, he saw and he looked and he lusted and he inquired. And even when he inquired, they said, that's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Emphasis, she's married, dude. And he called for her and he went under to her and he committed one of his life's great sins. And David, I believe, was affected for so many years. As he writes in the Psalms, he said, the moisture of my spiritual life was turned into the drought of summer. And he cried out in Psalm 51, restore the joy of my salvation. Make the bones which thou hast broken to rejoice. See what sin will do in your life. So a man or a woman of God runs from those things. Flee the sin. So we must flee. It is so important. And by the way, the phrase in the Greek indicates a very subtle but important point is that we are accountable and we are responsible to do the fleeing. We can't be pursuing sin, asking God to deliver us from temptation. You have a problem with alcohol, you can't go walking in the bar while you're praying, lead me not into temptation, lead me not into temptation. <laughs> Slap that dude. You don't want to be led into temptation, then don't go that way, okay? Turn around and go the opposite direction. And it would actually indicate that we must flee. Now, here's the second mark of a man or a woman of God, and that is they follow, verse 11. So the first is to flee these things. The second is to follow after. And he tells us what to follow after. Righteousness, godliness, faith and love, patience and meekness. And I do believe that it's right to take them as couplets here. So we have the negative to flee, we have the positive to follow. Now, by the way, we must do both. We must run from evil, and we must follow righteousness. You can't just follow righteousness if you don't flee from evil. And you can't just flee from evil if you don't follow righteousness. A lot of times people, Pastor Miller, Pastor Miller, I just, I'm struggling with sin, I'm just having such a difficult time. And it could be because you're not following righteousness. You're trying to fight sin, but you're not focusing on God. The Bible says that we resist the devil, he'll flee, but it also says we draw near to God, and he will do what? He'll draw near to us. So we have to do both. The negative, flee, and the positive, we have to follow. Now, in the Greek, the word means, it's sometimes translated, interestingly enough, it's used to translate persecute. It's used that way in Matthew 5, and verse 10. So the word follow means to have a determination. It means to have a persistence. It means to exert energy. It means to have purpose. So it conveys the idea of effort and energy and purpose and focus with all that we have. We're to focus on following after these things. And let's look at what we're to follow after. It's very clear and very practical. First couplet is righteousness and godliness. Now, righteousness perhaps conveys the idea of my right living before men, that when men look at me, they see that I'm living a righteous life. Now, there are three kinds of righteousness in the Bible. God, who first of all alone, is perfectly righteous. The only person, one that's perfectly righteous is God. And then there's positional righteousness. The moment you are born again, and you are forgiven of your sins, you actually, before God in your standing, are declared to be righteous. So important. We talked a lot about that in Romans chapter 8 on Sunday morning. And then thirdly, there is practical righteousness. That's how you live out in your daily life. The third righteousness is what Paul has in mind for Timothy to follow after. Follow after living a righteous life. It's not enough just to say, I've been forgiven, and I have the righteousness of Christ imputed to me. Now I want to practice it. I want to live it out in my daily life. So it's so very important. And then godliness, the second half of that couplet, is how I relate toward God. So that means I worship God, I pray to God, I love God, I sing to God. Last couple of days, I've been trying to sing a little bit more lately. And just, you know, as I go about a certain time of the day and things, it just, you know, okay, I'm just going to spend some time singing and worshiping God. You know, you don't have to just wait to come to church to sing. 
You can sing in the car. You can sing in the shower. It sounds really good in the shower, too, by the way. You know, the nozzle becomes your microphone, and you're like, can rock out. And you can sing as you work, whistle while you work. And God puts a song in our hearts. So if you're godly, you're going to be God-centered. You're going to be singing to Him and worshiping Him and talking to Him and rejoicing in Him. So you're living righteously, and you are worshiping a God of, that's worthy to be worshiped. Notice the second thing that we're to pursue, faith and love. Faith and love. Faith is actually the concept of faithfulness. That we're to live faithfully, obediently to God and His Word. So we're to be learning the Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. And it also conveys the idea that we live by trusting God. The true man or woman of God is one who trusts God in all your ways. You lean not on your own understanding in all your ways to acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. And then love is that fruit of the Spirit which is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We love God and we love the brethren and we have a love for law. So we have righteousness, godliness, faith, and love. And then the third couplet is patience and meekness, verse 11. Now patience, and I've mentioned before, is the concept of endurance. The word literally means to remain under. So when you're under weight and pressure, you continue, you keep going, you persevere. And you do it, verse 14, we're going to see in just a moment, until Jesus comes and takes us home. And so we want to keep going, we want to keep persevering. And then we also follow meekness. Now meekness is not weakness. The best definition I've ever run across for meekness is power under control. You know, a horse that is obedient to its rider is called a meek horse. Horses are big, they're powerful, they're strong, they can throw the rider off at any moment if they really wanted to. But a ho horse that cooperates is meek. So it doesn't mean you're weak, it means you have power under control. So a godly person is one who has surrendered everything to God. Their, their, their attitudes, their motives, their heart, their actions are all under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is actually referred to as meek. He said, I am meek and lowly of heart. We're going to look at the Beatitudes a week from Sunday, and we'll be coming to blessed are the meek. Meekness is one of the ways to be a happy person. So it's a spirit-controlled life. So we are to flee. We are to follow. And then here's the third mark of a man or woman of God. They are to fight. Notice that in verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Stop right there. Now the word fight, we get our word agonize. It's the Greek word agonizo. And it means a good agony. Literally translated would be agonize the good agony. Its imagery is one of two things. It's either that of the athletic contest or that of the military conflict. And I don't know how to be sure which of the two, but both of them are apropos or apply. If you're an athlete, it's difficult. You agonize. If you're in a war, you fight with agony. You're, you're laboring very difficultly. But Paul did quite often use the Greek athletic games to picture the Christian life, the running of the race, the looking for the prize, and stretching for the goal. So it's very possible that he has this word agonizo in mind. He's thinking of the athletic arena. And maybe he's thinking of the runners. And they ran in the Greek Olympics of, of the first century. They would run. They were runners. And when you run, it's very agonizing. You put everything you've got into it. So in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we'll get it in several weeks, Paul, in speaking of his ministry, said, I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. I have run the race. I have finished the course that is set before me. So we're all running in a race, and we need to run 
with all that we've got. We need to fight. We need to agonize. Now notice it's the good fight of faith. So we're fighting for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. So victory comes through faith, and faith comes by, again, hearing the Word of God. So there is things that we need to fight for, we need to stand for, we need to work hard for, and that is the Gospel. And it's going to be brought out several times in this passage. But there's actually a fourth that we need to see as a mark of a godly man or woman, and that is to fasten onto or lay hold. If you want to alliterate all four, it would be flee, it would be fight, it would be, or flee, it would be follow, and then it would be fight, and then it would be fasten. And that's seen in verse 12. Hold on to eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So he's using now the idea of physically grasping or holding on to. So I made the point of fastening on to grabbing a hold of. When Jesus was walking on the water, the Sea of Galilee, to the disciples in the boat, and you remember Peter came out of the boat and started walking toward Jesus, but then he looked at the waves and he saw that they were going to crash over him and he got fearful and he started to sink. The same Greek word is used there when Jesus said, it says that Jesus grabbed hold of Peter. He reached out and took hold of Peter. So this is what we're to reach out and we're to grab a hold of in verse 12. Eternal life, whereunto you have called, you've been called and you professed a good profession before many witnesses. Now, that statement could confuse people. So I hope... I can kind of shed some light on what Paul means by the statement. Because you're thinking, well, isn't Timothy already saved, for heaven's sake? Isn't he a believer? Doesn't he have eternal life? And the answer is yes. When you are born again, guess what you get? Eternal life. Not only are your sins forgiven, but you have present possession, eternal life. But eternal life has two aspects. It has the aspect of quantity, you'll live forever. But it more has the idea of quality. We tend to think of eternal life as just when we die and we go to heaven. I have eternal life. When I die, I'm going to go to heaven. But no, the Christian has eternal life right here, right now. And what it is, it's a quality of life. It's life in a new dimension. It's life in a new realm. It's spiritual life. Jesus said it like this in John 17. He said, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. It's knowing God through Jesus Christ brings you into this new dimension. And you can testify to that. When you got born again, you had a new joy, you had a new peace, you had a new purpose, you had a new life and, 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 and it was like, wow, I, I'm, I'm finally really living and enjoying life. I know God. So when Paul tells Timothy to lay hold of eternal life, he's talking about the quality of life. And what he's telling actually Timothy here is that we, with all that you've got, with all of your gusto, with all your energy, with all of your strength, try to live the Christian life to the fullest. Enjoy the Christian life. Jesus said it like this, I have come that you might have what? Life. And that you might have it more what? Abundantly. You would think when you look at some Christians that Jesus said, I have come that you might have bummer. <laughs> and bummer more abundantly. Look like you've been baptized in lemon juice. Yeah, it's really a bummer. I'm a Christian. No more fun. Can't go to parties anymore, you know. But I get to go to heaven, but it's until then I'm living in hell. And you look like hell. Jesus said, I've come not only to give you life, but life more abundantly. So he's actually saying, make the passion of your Christian life to enjoy your Christianity. That's why I've been singing the last few days a little bit. Just trying to sing somewhere. I want to be a happy Christian. I want to joy in the Lord and rejoice in my salvation. 
and to be thankful for what God has given to me. But it has to be something that you hold on to, that you grab a hold of. Paul said it like this in Philippians 3, uh, chapter 2, verse 12. He said, work out your own salvation and do it with what? Fear and trembling. To work out means to live it out. It's the same kind of an idea of to grab a hold of, to go for the gusto, and to live your life to the fullest. Live out your Christianity, how important that is. Now, notice also in verse 12 that you lay hold of eternal life, which also you are called, that's the call of God to salvation, and then the public professing a good profession before many witnesses. So remember, Timothy, when you were saved and God called you, and remember when you professed your faith and you were baptized publicly? Now follow after that, pursue that, and live for God. So those are the marks of a man or a woman of God. They flee, they follow, they fight, and they fasten on to the life that is eternal. But he moves in the next section, verse 13 to 16, to charge Timothy, this man of God. Now this is the last official charge in the epistle. He says, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickens all things. And he begins to describe this God who quickens all things. And before Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Now he just mentions Timothy's profession, or confession at the end of verse 12. Now he mentions Jesus' good profession, or confession, before Pontius Pilate. He was a perfect witness. Then notice verse 14 that thou keep this commandment, I keep this charge, without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times, and Paul didn't know when the Lord would come. He was anticipating his coming, but he had no idea. No man knows the day or the hour. When his time comes, he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light, which no man can approach, unto whom no man hath seen, and interestingly he says, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. That's not the end of the epistle, so don't close your Bible yet. We have more to cover. But he charges Timothy. This is a one of many in the epistle, the charges that Paul gave to Timothy. Now, I want you to know the witnesses as he calls him into the courtroom, and it's a solemn oath or a charge he puts him under. There are two witnesses there in verse 13. The first witness is God the Father. I charge you in the sight of God. This is a reference to God the Father. And he quickens or he makes alive all things. That's an amazing statement saying that God is the one that gives life to everything. Everything that has life gets that life from God. And He gives life to all things. And then notice also that He is charging him before God the Son in verse 13. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good Confession. So Timothy, I'm charging you. Remember, God is looking and you're standing before Christ. And then he gives them the charge in verse 14 to 16. And let's look at the actual charge. That. So he says, I give thee charge in verse 13, but he doesn't get to the actual charge until verse 14. So he says, that thou keep this commandment. And I want you to keep it without spot. I want you to keep it unrebukable, and I want you to keep it until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is this commandment that he's supposed to keep? The commandment is Paul's letter of 1 Timothy and the doctrines that Paul had given to Timothy. The commandment is the apostolic doctrines, the Word of God, the Scriptures. So he had entrusted them to Timothy. As you close this chapter in this last chapter of the book, there's a lot of imagery here of the fact that we as 
Christians, and especially a pastor, is a steward over a sacred trust that God has committed to us. The idea of deposited with us, He's given to us. So I'm charging you that you keep, that you hold on to, that you preserve, that you keep God's Word, that you not depart from God's Word. And you do it without spot. You don't, you don't pervert it. You don't twist it. You don't dilute it. And you do it with a life that is unrebukable. Same word was used for the qualification for a pastor in chapter 3 when we read that phrase, above reproach. So you're supposed to do this in a way that is above reproach, unrebukable, as others would bring a charge against you. And you do it, I love it, verse 14, until the Lord comes back. Here's a reference to the coming again of Jesus. Now, my guess is, and I don't know if it's true or not, but my guess is that it's perhaps a reference to the second coming. He uses the word appearing. The idea is the manifestation, the coming or the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when I say the second coming, I say that to make it clear that this is not the rapture. It could be a reference to the rapture, and it's very possible that he's saying the Lord could rapture us, and Paul believed the Lord could come at any moment. But the Bible teaches that before the second coming, that the church, the bride of Christ, will be caught up. That's what the word rapture means. And it's laid out pretty clearly in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, where Paul says that, I would not have you to be ignorant about those that have died or fallen asleep, that you sorrow not as others who have no hope. For if we believe Jesus died and rose again, those who have fallen asleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. For this I tell you by the word of the Lord, that the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with what? The trumpet of God. I love that. And the two things are going to happen. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. That's the resurrection of those that have died in Christ, their bodies will be resurrected, and they will be given a new body, reunited with their soul in the presence of the Lord. And then those who are alive and remain, that's what we hope will be in that group. That we won't die, but we'll be alive. And the other day I was talking with somebody, wouldn't it be cool if we got raptured while we're having church here at Revival? We don't even have to go get in the car and go home. We just go straight to heaven. That would be awesome, right? We just get caught up to be with the Lord. The word is harpazo. It means raptured or caught up. And so Paul is telling us that we are to keep His Word until the Lord comes again. And we should be living in light of that. It should be a motive for holiness and godly living. Now when he references Jesus Christ, he said, which in His times He shall show who is the blessed and only potentate the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. Now, what an awesome statement that is, that He will come and manifest Himself, show that He is sovereign, only potentate, He's King of kings, and Lord of lords, and that He is also immortal, He only hath immortality dwelling in the light, that He's also holy, or He has purity, He dwells in the light, and no man can approach. And then Paul also says that he's to be praised. He closes with the doxology at the end of verse 16. He says, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now I skipped over something I don't want to miss in verse 16 when it says that he dwells in light, no man can approach, whom no man has seen nor can see. Just an interesting statement. You know God is spirit. You can't see God. You you actually can't see God. Now, I I, I can't be dogmatic about this, and I I don't like to speculate, but it's something that I've wrestled with all my Christian life, and that's when we get to heaven, when the Bible says we're going to see God, we're going to be looking at God. How can we see God if God is a spirit? And a possibility is, and I'm cool with it, whatever it is, I'm going to be in heaven, so it's going to be cool, okay? I'm not going to go, I don't think I want to go to heaven then. You know, am I going to see God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit? It's very possible. I don't know about you, but this blesses my heart. It's very possible that because of the incarnation, 
Because the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, became a man, took on flesh, was crucified, buried, rose from the dead. Now when Jesus came out of the grave, it was his body metamorphosized, transformed. Just like your body's going to come out of the grave. If you have a hard time understanding or believing that your body will be resurrected, just look at the resurrection. He is the prototype. He's the forerunner. He's called the first fruits of those that sleep. So it's just possible that because of the incarnation, Jesus Christ is sending back to heaven, that when we see God, it's going to be the Son of God, and that's who we're going to be looking at and seeing face to face. What a glorious thing that will be to be able to look upon His face, the One who saved us by His grace. Amen? I've only had one real close to near-to-death experience. I was kidnapped at gunpoint and really believed that I was going to be killed. And as I was in that situation, I had this great sense and consciousness that I'm going to see Jesus face to face. That I'm going to actually be looking at the face of Jesus Christ. What a glorious hope that is. So God cannot be seen, and it says there in that verse, nor can be seen, but I believe that in in Christ we're going to be able to see God as He sits there upon the throne, and we throw our crowns at His feet, and we worship Him for all eternity. Now, in verse 17 to 19, and we won't tarry on this closing section, and then verse 20 to 21, but in verse 17 to 19, it's a postscript. It's kind of a concluding thing that Paul wants to throw in here. It's an admonition to those that are rich. Now, he's warned about those false teachers that say that godliness is a way to get rich. But he wants to bring it all into balance and point that there were some Christians in Ephesus that had money. Now, it's possible to be a Christian and to be rich in this world. It's not a sin to be rich. So he gives them some instruction if you fall into this category. Some of you are going, oh, this isn't for me. It doesn't fall into my category. I'm a Christian, but I'm not a rich Christian. Well, nevertheless, it's in the Bible. Charge them that are rich in this world. So this is a Christian who is well off and has material goods. That they be not high-minded. That they not trust in uncertain riches. But do they trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy? The word enjoy is in the Bible. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, that they be ready to distribute, they be willing to communicate, that they lay up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. In other words, again, this is that they may have the life that is real. They may really enjoy the spiritual life by how they relate to their treasures and their riches. Now notice he doesn't tell the rich Christians to sell everything they have and give it to the poor. When I was a young Christian, I was over in Hawaii for a few months, and I was a baby Christian. I ran into a cult group called the Children of God. Their leader was a man by the name of Moses David Berg, and they were just a really wicked cult group. But I was a baby Christian. I didn't know that. And I encountered them on the street, and they tried to entice me to follow them and join their group and join their movement and you know, follow them. But their, their thing was you had to sell everything that you have and give it to them. Now, all I had was a surfboard and a pair of trunks. <laughs> but I wasn't about to give it up. You know, I came to Hawaii to surf. I didn't come, you know, it's like, what do you want me to give? And it's like, kind of like, you know, give us everything you have Give it to us and follow Jesus. Well, isn't that convenient for you? You say, well, what about the rich young ruler? Jesus said, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, come follow me, and you have riches in heaven. That was a very unique and special situation. That rich young ruler was covetous and loved money and was attached to his things, and Jesus knew that it was needful for him to give them up. But there's no blanket statement or teaching in the Bible that every Christian must take a vow of poverty. So if God has blessed you, that's just what it is. God has blessed you. But here's some very important instructions for those who are rich Christians. Number one, don't be proud. A good translation of high-minded would be arrogant. 
And isn't, isn't it easy when you are well off or you're rich or you have a lot of things to begin to be proud, thinking you're, you're special, you're somebody? Somehow rich people think because I'm rich, I'm better than other people? Or, you know, it's because of what I've done or what I've accomplished? So he warns them, don't be high-minded, don't be arrogant, don't be proud. And then he says, nor trust in uncertain riches. Don't trust in your money. Now that's a good admonition for rich or poor. Don't trust your money. Money is fleeting. So you don't put your confidence and your trust in money. They're described as uncertain. But what you do put your trust in, even if you have a lot of money, you put your trust in the living God. And it's God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So you can have a lot of money, but no enjoyment. Only God can bring joy to the heart of a person. God wants to bless you. So do trust in God. And then in verse 18, do good. That's the fourth thing you're supposed to do if you're rich. You're to do good. Don't be proudful. Don't trust in money. Trust in God and do good. And he breaks it down, verse 18. Be rich in good works. Be ready to share. Ready to distribute. Be willing to communicate. And if you do that, you're laying up in store for yourself a good foundation against the time to come that you may lay hold of eternal life. So you're storing your riches in heaven. This is what Jesus taught in Matthew 6. Lay not up for yourself treasures on earth. Moth and rust corrupt. Thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupt and thieves cannot break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The less you have in this world, the more you look for the world to come. The less you have, the less it can take hold of your heart. It was John Wesley that said, I give my treasures away before they get a hold of my heart and captivate my love. Now in closing... Verse 22 to 21 is the Paul's urgent closing plea. Oh, Timothy. Now again, when he said, oh, thou man of God, oh, Timothy. And this is the first time he's used his name since chapter 1, early in the first chapter. So he's doing it for emphasis and for attention. Oh, Timothy. It's almost like in these last statements that Paul is depends these words. He's really wanting to get Timothy's attention. By the way, the name Timothy or Timotheus means one who honors God. He says, guard that which is committed to thy trust. The word keep means to guard. It's a banking term. It speaks of a deposit that is entrusted to us. We're to take good care of. It's interesting that in Luke 2, when the shepherds were watching their sheep by night, when the angels appeared to announce the birth of the babe in Bethlehem, that's the same Greek word that means keep or to guard or watch over. That which is committed to thy trust. And the trust there is actually the banking term. It means that it's been deposited to you. Avoid foolish or avoid, excuse me, profane or sinful and vain babblings. Just foolish talk that's empty and babblings. And oppositions of science falsely so-called. This oppositions, we, we actually get our word antithesis from it. So it says, it's saying avoid people that try to teach the opposite of what I'm teaching. Those who come and teach other things. If somebody comes to you and they're teaching things contrary to the Bible, then you need to avoid that. You need to get away from that. You don't get embroiled in vain, empty statements. And then I love it, he says, oppositions of science. Now the word science in my King James translation, could throw people for a curve. It's actually where we get our word gnosko, which is the word that we get our word Gnostic from, which is a false cult that emphasized knowledge. But it had, it, a better translation would be knowledge. So it's a knowledge that's not knowledge. It's falsely so-called. It's not true knowledge. He's not condemning science here, by the way. So if you read that, you go, oh, i gotta, I got to drop out of my science class because the Bible says to avoid it. No, 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 no. It's talking about a fake knowledge. I, 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 I weary myself sometimes when people come to me with their crazy ideas, trying to push their wares. Because I'm a pastor, they always want to try to convince me, you know, 
of their silly ideas and their doctrines. And you know, Paul just says, look, don't give it the time of day. He's false knowledge. Just, it's just a bunch of babble. It's a bunch of hot air. I must admit, sometimes I've turned the television on, listened to preachers, and I go, that man says nothing. He's saying nothing. It's all just a bunch of babble. It gets people all excited and gets them all pumped up. And it sounds like he's really deep and has all this knowledge, but there's really nothing there. It's knowledge falsely so called. Some translations have philosophical speculations, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. So those who get into these philosophical speculations, this empty knowledge, they profess that, that, that faith that they profess, they've erred. That means they've missed the mark concerning the faith. This is the body of truth that we believe and we hold to. And then he actually closes with the benediction. Grace be with you. The, amen. And the word the in closing is plural. So it's not just grace with you, Timothy, but it's grace to you, all the believers there in the church of Ephesus. And this is why I say that this epistle, even though it's a pastoral epistle, has application to all believers. And it's the faith and the grace of God that will be with thee and keep thee. Grace comes through Jesus Christ. Pastors need grace, and all God's people need grace. Amen? Now, just by way of reminding you, there are four marks of a man or woman of God. They flee wickedness. They follow righteousness. They fight the good fight of faith. They keep the sacred trust. Paul said, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. That means that in these last days, God has entrusted us with His Word, with the truth of the Gospel, with the doctrines of Scripture, and we to preserve them. And then we are to fasten or take hold of eternal life. We're to, jo- we're to enjoy the abundant life that God has for us in and through Jesus Christ. Amen?